Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Yeah. Now, <laughs> uh, Lorenzo Vidini, who was to deliver today's very important lecture, contacted me several weeks ago and let me know that he needed to be out of the country, but had enlisted his distinguished colleague to stand in his place. As one who is in the business of engaging the best and the brightest speakers to enlighten, enlighten us all, I was at first disappointed, then relieved, and then delighted. Bravo, Dr. Vidini, and so today I'm happy to introduce to you Alex Hitchens, who will deliver the talk on ISIS in America, or his variation on the theme. <laughs> Dr. Hitchens is the research director at the Program on Extremism at George Washington University in Washington, where Dr. Vidini serves as director. Prior to taking on the position at uh, G, uh, GW, Dr. Hitchens had been head of research at the Internal Center, International Center on Study of Radicalization and a lecturer at the War Studies Department at King's College London. In addition, he has advised European policymakers um, and uh, police forces on uh, counter radicalization and lectures regularly to diverse audiences on these related issues. In this puzzling and alarming era, it is more important than ever that we understand better the reasons for radicalization, the nature of it, and strategies that are useful for discouraging it. With Alex's permission, I will also reveal to you that he is the son of the late remarkable Christopher Hitchens, who took the time in the final days of his life to share his wit and wisdom with us here in Scranton. Alex, please come. Put on. Thanks, Sandra, uh, for that very generous introduction. Um, Thanks also for organizing this. Uh, thank you also to Emily Brees, um, who's very uh, professionally uh, helped me get here. Um, so just very briefly about my center, um, raised in George Washington University, called the Program on Extremism. Uh, can, if you Google us, we've got a website too, which provides information like this. Uh, essentially an academic research center that looks at um, terrorism and radicalization in America, but quite specifically these days, um, ISIS, Islamic State, and other jihadist group uh, activities um, here, both in re recruiting um, and plotting uh, attacks. Uh, what you see in front of you here um, is uh, our monthly update graph, which kind of gives the latest figures on IS activity. This is all based on our uh, analysis of um, most recent uh, legal court records, um, interviews with uh, police, FBI, and also uh, lawyers of often IS uh, defendants. Um, now, it's to, one of the things to note about the U.S. experience is that um, really the, the, the size of the IS problem here um, is among the smallest of, of any Western country. Uh, Europe, the, the numbers in Europe are vastly bigger. Uh, in my uh, previous home of London, um, uh, much more significant uh, numbers, even more so in Germany, Belgium, France. Um, per capita, um, as well as just uh, raw numbers. Um, so yeah, the first thing to say is the U.S. luckily has one of the smaller issues with this, and yet it's still a problem, as we see in the, in the media. Uh, what we want to try and do is cut through a lot of that commentary and give you some more of, of the facts and a couple of little stories about some of the individuals who've been involved. Um, so just, just looking at the numbers, some of you may not be able to quite see it from where you're sitting. Um, uh, Despite this being a small issue compared to the rest of the West, uh, the numbers are still unprecedented as far as jihadist group uh, mobilization. Um, as of end of March, which is what these numbers are, are at, uh, 53 individuals, that's 45% of the overall, um, have traveled or attempted to travel uh, to Syria or Iraq to join the Islamic State. Um, 900 active investigations against IS sympathizers in all 50 states. Um, and we have a total of 117 Altogether, individuals who've been charged with IS-related terror offenses uh, since the first uh, arrest was in March uh, 2014. Um, of them, 30% accused of involvement in plots inside the U.S. Uh, so, you know, that's actually, that may be surprising for you to hear that actually th only 30% of those who are interested in IS in America 
are actually interested in terrorism domestically. So, you know, the terrorism is kind of what obviously gets our attention most. It's the biggest kind of threat to us, perhaps, and it's what the media are most interested in. But actually, the IS story in the West, in America, and more generally, is not just one of terrorism, but one of wanting to be part of this group, wanting to join this group, uh, be part of this sort of utopian project that it was undertaking and is still trying to undertake in, in, in Syria and Iraq. Um, so actually more people have tried to join or join the group than have tried to commit terrorism, terrorist acts in its name. So really the, the terrorism is the kind of tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more to this story. 89% um, male, um, but the number of women involved has increased and it's again an unprecedented number as far as jihadist groups go in the US. And also another thing worth noting, uh, especially considering kind of the recent politics of this and, and, and um, the policies that are being looked at under the new administration here, uh, the vast majority are um, American citizens born here, um, first, second generation Americans. Um, I think it's the percentage we have is something like 90 plus percent. Um, so again, that's quite relevant again when, when we consider um, the kind of the recent discussion about this, you know, who these people are, where they're coming from, are they actually coming into the U.S. or are they being uh, created here? Um, so who are these Americans of, of ISIS? And I'll give you some introductory thoughts, which I'll then elaborate on. Um, I'll try and keep my remarks fairly short because I'm more interested in what you guys want to talk about and, and ask me about. Um, so the profiles vary so widely, again, that it's very difficult to kind of come up with one type, as it were, of IS, sympathizer, activist, recruit. Um, they differ widely in race, age, social class, education, family background. Uh, and the motivations are equally diverse and defy any sort of easy analysis. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at a couple of cases that are indicative of that in, in a bit. Uh, social media and the internet, you hear a lot about that in IS, in Islamic State, ISIS use of, of the internet, clearly plays a, a central role in radicalization, uh, at times as well, of, of actually mobilizing people uh, uh, to act. Uh, my center, again, the program on extremism, uh, we've identified around 500 Americans uh, and or US-based IS sympathizers who are active on social media platforms like Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, um, Telegram, and a number of others. Um, they do a number of things. Mostly, they spread propaganda, make it easily accessible to, to Americans here. Uh, they interact with like-minded individuals. They create online networks, create a sense of uh, uh, that someone who, who perhaps is looking into this group is not alone, despite you know being physically uh, on their own. Um, and some members of this online echo chamber then do make the leap into uh, actual militancy. So they go from keyboard warriors to actual um, terrorists. Um, and again, we'll we'll look at some of those stories. Um, it, it is Twitter where they are most active, and I don't know if, how much you guys follow this, but Twitter recently released a, a report where they said they, they kind of they suspended 300, I think it was 300,000 um, IS sympathetic Twitter accounts on their on their platform. But it's very difficult to do this, and, and the results are hard to gauge in terms of how successful that is. It's very easy to kind of return. Um, so often you get. Um, account suspended and pop right back up in this sort of never-ending game of cat and mouse or whack-a-mole um, that the authorities and the, and the tech companies are playing with uh, IS and its sympathizers here. And we've kind of found three major categories. Again, I'll elaborate on them uh, later on. Uh, uh, so it's three categories of Twitter, of IS Twitter users. Uh, the first we call the nodes. Um, they are the people who generate the primary content. They create the propaganda, put it on the platform. Uh, we also have the amplifiers who essentially they don't create anything original, but they uh, help amplify the message by retweeting and spreading these messages out. And then we have others we call the shout outs who essentially promote new accounts to, to their network. And often the, the accounts that are suspended when they return with the same user and a new name, the shout out uh, members on Twitter will make sure that that account is, is you know, re-recognized as being that original person. So account gets suspended, he comes back up, and everyone says, hey, you know, everyone who used to like you know, X, he's now under this new name, and essentially making sure they, they maintain their presence online. Um, but you know, this, isn't, this story isn't just about uh, social media. Um, while we have instances of sort of purely web-driven dr uh, uh, individual radicalization, um, 
in most cases uh, in the US, individuals are initially cultivated and later strengthen their interest in ISIS and its narrative through face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and relationships. That's still really key to getting someone to move from ideas to action, is that face-to-face -face physical interaction with, with like-minded individuals and, and potential recruiters. Um, so really, it's, it's the way to understand the, the online you know, presence of IS and its role is to essentially see the online and offline dynamics complementing each other. Sometimes for someone, the introduction to the group may be online, and then they, you know, create those these networks and, and and then meet these people physically and, and sort of strengthen their resolve. And other times it can happen uh, the other way around. Um, again, as I as I touched on the the kind of spectrum of U.S.-based sympathizers' actual involvement with IS does vary very significantly. Uh, they range from those who are merely inspired by its message to those who. Um, relatively few who reached uh, mid-level leadership positions within the group after uh, actually successfully traveling to join it. Um, so uh, what explains the recent sort of upsurge in American jihadi recruits? Uh, how do they embrace this extreme ideology? Um, what makes them turn their backs on their country and in most cases their families? You know, this is the kind of big question and you know, I'll tell you from the outset, no one has the definitive answer on this. And, we may never have that um, because it's not. This is not a new question. You know, why do people? Why do seemingly normal, settled, mainstream people join terrorist groups? You know, there's many different reasons for this, um, and you know, we've identified a couple of, of interesting little um, caveats to this that that can help explain it. Really, at the beginning, 2014, when when the real uh, interest in IS kind of began. Uh, well, actually, there was the first arrest. The first IS arrest was in, in March 2014. But actually, the interest in IS began really around the time of, um, as the uh, Syrian rebellion began changing um, from a sort of uh, popular revolution against Assad to um, being taken over by, by, by IS. Um, so really the first wave of Americans who got interested in IS were a mix of people who were already jihadists, who were guys who were interested in Al-Qaeda and kind of now following IS. But there was also a big group of people um, who were moved by this underlying sense uh, of sympathy and compassion. Um, and I know those aren't the words you you'd usually associate with an IS uh, sympathizer. Um, but the sympathy and compassion um, to, uh, motivating them uh, to become interested and invested in the Syrian conflict, people who were outraged by the Assad um, atrocities <coughs> against the Syrian civilian population. Um, and and the, the, that being very easy to see on, in the media, in the mainstream, and in social media. Um, the, 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 the suppression of the Syrian revolution um, and the massacres of, uh, of the Syrian uh, civilian population got people interested in the conflict. And some people began to see it as their personal mission to do something about it. They didn't necessarily say, I want to go to Syria and set up a, a you know, totalitarian theocracy or, or I want to join a terrorist group or a jihadist group, but I just want to go and fight Assad. And so a lot of these guys, that was the kind of initial interest. Um, and as I said, the pictures and videos capturing the aftermath of these uh, civilian massacres um, were very accessible to people. And they moved, they moved a lot of people, Muslim and non-Muslim. Um, and led, yeah, some people into that, that take that first step into militancy. And this is a similar story that goes, if we go back to Afghanistan and the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, if we go to, the, uh, to Bosnia and the massacre of uh, the genocide of Muslims uh, there, uh, this is often what can get people at least the, the foot in the door um, in terms of being interested in this. But there was a major shift, um, however. And, and so today, if a guy gets interested in IS, he can't really use the excuse of, oh, you know, I just wanted to go in and, and just fight Assad, because they know, now they know exactly what they're going to go and join. Um, unfortunately, um, IS declared the, its uh, self-declared caliphate in June 2014, and since then, uh, we've seen this motivation of the recruits kind of morphing, uh, revolving more around fulfilling what they perceive to be religious obligations, performing what they call the Hijra, which is a term that refers to actually uh, Muhammad's uh, moving from Mecca to Medina. Um, this is a, a term that is now used by jihadists to say, you know, just like Muhammad fled Mecca to Medina, uh, Muslims should do the same and to fight for the, the sort of defense of Islam. Um, and this opportunity then also to make the Hijra and, and uh, participate in the creation of a utopian 
Islamic super state as they see it. Um, this society that they are they have been told is the ideal Islamic society, um, and they want to be part of of um, helping establish that and fight for it. Um, but you know, again, these ideological commitments, motivations are still deeply intertwined with, and impossible to separate from personal uh, motives. Uh, if I were to quote the National Counterterrorism Center on this, they observe that those who embrace IS ideology tend to be disenfranchised individuals seeking ideological, religious, and personal fulfillment. So that is one possible profile. Uh, search for belonging, belonging meaning, um, identity uh, appears to be one of these crucial motivators for many Americans and other Westerners uh, who embrace IS ideology. You know, if you're a, a Syrian or even an Iraqi, the reasons for joining IS are, are, are much more different, and more clear-cut in many cases. Um, again, if you're a Syrian who was not with the Assad regime, uh, were, was part of a, a population that was being, say, bombed by, by the Syrian Air Force, um, and you felt you wanted to fight it back, at one point, IS pretty much just became the only game in town. And, you know, that's not to excuse people joining the group, but this can offer you some more kind of clear-cut and more simplistic explanation, you know, just joining for survival. Uh, in Iraq, you have a slightly different issue of a, a sort of Shia dictatorship, as, they, as, as a lot of the Sunnis see it, uh, suppressing you know, Sunni rights, IS presenting itself as a defender of Sunnis against the Shia government. Um, and again, you know, this, this is a kind of more clear-cut reason. Why an American would take on this fight is, I guess, far more complicated and, and confusing to many. Um, so this is why we, we were talking about this issue of you know, belonging, meaning, identity. An ideology. Um, if I were to give you a couple of examples then of American individuals who've joined and, and their words, um, this search for meaning was particularly well encapsulated by a guy called Monir Abu Salha, 20-year-old, 22-year-old Floridian, um, what we think to be the first American to have died in a, as a suicide bomber uh, for IS in Syria. Um, and actually, sorry, not for IS, for Jabhat al-Nusra, so another jihadist group. Um, and just to quote him in a 2014 video he released uh, before his death, I lived in America. I know how it is. You have all the fancy amusement parks, the restaurants, the food and all this crap, and the cars. You think you're happy. You're not happy. You're never happy. I was never happy. I was always sad and depressed. Life sucked, as he put it. Uh, in contrast, he described living in Syria and fighting and having this new mission as the best life I've, I've ever lived. So it gave him a completely new way of viewing himself, his role in his society. Um, and this is a guy who just didn't feel he had that here. Um, despite coming from a very different background, another fellow American who made the journey to Syria um, uh, has also kind of displayed a similar malaise. Ariel Bradley, woman from an uh, underprivileged family in Chattanooga, suburb of Hickson. Uh, she was homeschooled by her evangelical Christian mother until she rebelled, left home as a teenager. Um, spent the following years wandering, looking for this new life, new way to understand herself, a uh, new identity. Uh, just to quote one of her former uh, roommates, she was definitely always looking for love, always looking for that sense of belonging. That was an interview with BuzzFeed that one of her um, roommates said, uh, gave. Another friend recalled what they referred to as her uh, clearly segmented life. Uh, just to quote them again, when I first met her, she was a Christian, then she was a socialist, then she was an atheist, and now she's a Muslim. As far as I could tell, it was always in relation to whatever guy she was interested in at the time. <laughs> Poor girl. Um, so if she meets a guy who's an atheist, this is again to quote, this is just to quote, um, if she meets a guy who's an atheist, she's an atheist, falls into that for a year. Guy leaves, she meets somebody new, takes on a new... Uh, starts all over again. It seems that whatever guy she was with, she would just crawl into his skin and become, kind of become him. So again, just in terms of the personal stories of how these people can fall into this, it's just not so simple. Um, at one point, she fell in love with the Muslim patron of the pizza restaurant she worked at. Um, got close to him and quite soon converted to his religion. Things didn't work out with him, but she kept hold of her uh, belief in Islam and joined a Muslim dating site. I ended up meeting an Iraqi immigrant living in Sweden and meeting him and marrying him and having a kid with him. Um, under the influence of her husband, her Islamic faith became more and more conservative and militant. 2014, they went to Syria together. So, you know, just two short stories there of people who join 
kind of gives you an idea about you know how this can happen, not quite in the ways one might you know expect. Uh, So-called radicalization, you know, this like, this process of joining an extremist group, uh, is a very complex, multifaceted process where ideas, personal experience, personality, emotion, violence, search for meaning, often all combine and work together to lead someone to join a group like ISIS. So never, never simple. Every story, every single story is unique. Uh, so this, 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 see, this sort of uh, search that people are on for the answer, you know, why, who, on, all, on the sort of ISIS question, it's, it's, um, you can see how difficult that is to come up with. Um, what we have to try and do, though, this is the final point on that, is, is to try and at least try and see if we can find a strain that connects them all. Uh, even that's pretty difficult. For some, it is, it is the, the, the ideology. It's you know, the, the, the taking on of this, this um, fairly coherent set of ideas that present itself as, 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 as pure Islam um, and making this convincing case that jihad, fighting, um, killing is the sort of key obligation for anyone who calls himself Muslim. Um, taking that on seems to be one of the major uh, motivators, but you know the reasons why people adopt that ideology are very, very different. Um, so I, that's kind of one of my elaborations on the on an introductory point I made. The other kind of thing I wanted to talk a bit more about was this this use of the internet, social media, Twitter, etc. Um, as we know, this offered the internet in general has offered new ways for extremist groups, uh, not just IS, but but all types from the far right to the far left to the religious extremists, to reach out and, and, and recruit people. Um, actually, the first that, that I know of uh, use of the internet by an extremist group was by the far right in America. Louis Beam, who you may be aware of, famous far right strategist, who came up originally with the, the lone wolf strategy of, of, sort of inspiring individuals to take part in terrorist action on their own. He used um, a bullet, what was kind of what the internet was in the early 80s, bulletin, bulletin boards. I don't know if any of you kind of used that. But 83, apparently, was the first time. And uh, that was a far-right bulletin board kind of used to spread ideas, ideology. So it's actually been a long time that extremists have used it. You know, it's just, in the end, it's just a new, the latest communication tool that a terrorist group's going to use. It shouldn't be that surprising. You know, when the printing press was invented, radical groups made great use of it. Uh, when the phone became what people use, you know, it's, it's just as remarkable as a terrorist using a phone, a terrorist using the internet. So it should obviously be expected as a communications tool. But what, what's kind of happened recently and what's changed is, is social media. There's something unique about social media that is, that is kind of inherently problematic. This is not to say that, we, that this, you know, this needs to change, but this is, this is the kind of rough part of, of what social media is offering, which is if you were to look at the, phys the, the physical world, the real world, how, how terror groups or extremist groups or cults, you know, how do they recruit people? Well, the things they need to do are identify vulnerable people, um, isolate them from the rest, other influences in their lives. So we're talking the physical world here. Um, isolate them from people who may change their mind, their family members, their former friends, you know, that, that, their, their, their old world. Isolate them from that. And instead place them in an echo chamber of sorts, a place where only like-minded individuals are, where they only talk about certain things, where they're isolated and where it becomes, where essentially they, all these, the extremist views, these, these sort of uh, um, fringe views become amplified to the extent that's, that's all they hear. They hear nothing else. No, no debate, no dissent. Um, this is how, this is what an extremist group would do with or without the internet. Um, so, you know, cutting them off and plugging them into networks of like-minded individuals where all these ideas are perpetuated, amplified. Um, unfortunately, this, I've also just described to you how social media works. Um, anyone who uses Twitter, for example, you know, if you're a, a fan of, uh, I should know the local NBA team, but I don't. Um, if you're a fan of, you know, a sports team, uh, you know, soon your, your Twitter feed is going to know that. And it's going to start showing you all the information about your sports team. It's not going to tell you about the rival team. It's not going to put you, nor is it going to put you in touch with anyone who supports any other team. It's actually going to, so it's going to, it's going to tailor all its messaging to what it knows you want to hear. And it's going to drown out everything it knows you don't want to hear. Not only is it going to do that, Twitter is also going to give you a number of suggestions on who else you should be talking to, who else you should be following. So it's not only doing the echo chamber, it's not only uh, cutting you off from other information, amplifying what you want to hear, it's also plugging you into networks of like-minded individuals. 
So this is something that social media is, is uniquely doing that the internet wasn't doing before. That is incredibly, this is what, this is the, this is the, the USP, or unique selling point of what social media is, this is what people want. And it's, it's great for, for many reasons. But it's all, this is, this is the, 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 the sort of the negative impact, that it is offered this new way to take into the uh, online world what, what extremist groups have always done in, in the physical world. Uh, and this is a, a big problem that, that social media companies are trying to figure out what to do about. And we recently had a conference, actually, we had Facebook and Twitter and Google and a number of others come and discuss this issue with government policymakers. And it's clearly one of the real sticking points, is how do we deal with this? Um, I think Facebook, for example, are looking at ways of maybe switching off that personalization element. You can choose, you know, okay, I don't want you to, to kind of personalize yourself to me, but then this, the issue of advertising comes in. You know, this is, you know, for the advertisers, this is crucial to know what you're interested in. And so this is how, this is how Facebook makes their money. They, they sell your information to advertising companies um, based on this personalization. So there's a problem there. Uh, also, there's a, they're looking into issues of, say, uh, or options of maybe show me the opposite of what I think, you know. Open up, you know, open up my, my world a bit more. And, you know, these, these are possible ways of dealing, of dealing with this. Um, but, yeah, it's undoubtedly an, an issue. Um, and we're still kind of figuring out what to do about it. Um, and so with that premise, uh, or with, at least with that introduction to this, just a little bit more detail on kind of how IS particularly make use of this. Um, one thing they do is what we call grooming from afar. So... Archetypal case, I'll give you another example here uh, from an individual based in the U.S. Uh, IS, online radicalization recruitment uh, case, um, chronicled in a, in a New York Times story, uh, someone ca uh, called Alex, um, it's the only name they give, a 23-year-old girl from rural Washington State, um, lived with her grandparents from an early age. She was, um, uh, her mother had lost custody of her due to uh, drug abuse. Uh, she was a college dropout who, in, in her own words, lived in the middle of nowhere. No connection whatsoever to Islam or Middle Eastern culture at all, you know. So, um, motivated, though, she, as she put it, by a horrified curiosity um, to seek out IS supporters after reading news of the execution of the American journalist uh, James Foley. Uh, then several months, her use of social media had plugged her into all the IS players in Syria. Um, she was exchanging messages, uh, talking with them over Skype. Um, talking to actual IS members, not just in America, but in Syria, real recruiters, professional terrorists. Um, over time, she started to express this, this idea of wanting to take on a new faith and live it more fully. And she was very slowly and, and meticulously groomed online in a very one-to-one, -one personalized process. New friends were showering her with money, books, gift cards, chocolates. Um, she soon converted to Islam embraced IS ideology. They offered her, these new friends of hers online, offered her this sense of belonging. Hours after declaring her conversion on Twitter, she uh, doubled her Twitter follower count, which for anyone who uses Twitter is real, is what you want. You know, it's what you're looking for from a post, to double your, your following uh, from one thing that you say. Um, and she tweeted in response to this, I actually have brothers and sisters, I'm crying, she said. So you can see even in this virtual world, this was a real, she could feel a real benefit from this, a real personal gain. Um, and she began to then kind of live this double life. Um, continued teaching Sunday school classes at her grandparents' church, uh, but behind closed doors, full-fledged IS sympathizer, fully adopted the ideology. Living this, this online persona. Um, and then living her, her, her normal real life. And I'll get back to how that can cause problems too. Um, at some point, I asked supporter in the UK who turned out to be a married middle-aged father, a big rap sheet, long criminal record, spent hours each day grooming her. Eventually told her that it was a sin for people who, had, who were Muslims to live in non-Muslim societies. She had to leave. And the only place she could go uh, was... Uh, IS territory. This was the only legitimate place where a Muslim should be, is what he told her. Uh, and he invited her to go to Aus Austria, marry a 45-year-old IS supporter he knew there, and move to Syria. This is what he asked her to do. Thankfully, it didn't happen. Uh, her grandmother actually kind of realized that something was up, um, confiscated all her electronics, confronted her online, uh, confronted her online contacts uh, via Skype. He kind of got very involved. Um, 
her double life now exposed, she promised to stop communicating with IS sympathizers, allowed her grandmother to change her Twitter uh, and email passwords. Um, but, you know, this is very hard to control this. And even, even if you are on top of it as a parent or a grandparent, um, you know, it, it, as, as far as we know, and she's still, you know, she hasn't done anything illegal. Um, despite this promise, she continues to do this to this day. Um, so that's a kind of, that's that kind of online grooming that, that can happen, identifying vulnerable individuals, exploiting their problems, offering them this sense of belonging, brotherhood, sisterhood. Also, we have people we call uh, travel it. How much time am I on time? Soon? Ten minutes? Okay, great. Uh, in addition to help uh, radicalize individuals and online, we have what we call, as I said, travel agents. Um, online IS supporters who offer logistical support to Americans and other Westerners who want to actually travel to join the group. Um, advice, logistical support, etc. To give you another, again, specific example, October 2014, three siblings from Chicago stopped at O'Hare International on their way to Syria. So they didn't make the journey, but uh, they intended to. This journey had been meticulously planned by the eldest sibling, 19-year-old engineering student Mohammed Hamza Khan. Uh, he was a graduate of Islamic school in the Chicago suburbs. And he'd been active online with a guy I'm going to get back to on Twitter, a guy called Raphael Hosti, British uh, kid from Manchester who was living, who had moved to Syria and was reaching out to Westerners, uh, encouraging them to travel and also giving them logistical assistance. Um, he'd been communicating with him for a long time using these personal messaging platforms that are also encrypted, another issue that I'll, I'll get into right at the end. Um, and according to authorities, um, this online contact of Mohammed's had uh, given him a phone number of, pe of the person he needed to contact when landing in Turkey, because uh, it's often the, the route people take is through Turkey. It's easier to fly there, obviously. Uh, you land there, you got the phone number of the, of the handler or the guy who's going to arrange your, your, your move over the border into Syria. Um, so this is how this was all happening, acting as these, these connections for people. Um, so, you know, and, and finally, they, they, when they arrested them at O'Hare, they searched their house. They found step-by-step -step guides that, they, that he was given um, to crossing the Turkish border, where to do it, who to contact, etc. cetera. Um, and handwritten farewell letters as well from each of the siblings to their parents. Um, so that's the kind of... Those are the ways that we've seen IS use the internet over the last, or social media particularly, over the last few uh, years. And the kind of latest um, thing that we've, this is from our own research, we created this, and I'll, I'll get, go you through a little bit on it. Uh, sorry, run you through a little bit on it. Um, this is our latest research is on what we call IS virtual entrepreneurs. These are guys, like the guy I just mentioned, Raphael Hosti, you can see at the bottom with the red circle. Um, these are guys who are in IS territory, who are Westerners, English speakers, who have traveled there and essentially are working together as part of this cell, this IS cell, uh, reaching out to Western uh, and American and other Western Muslims uh, and radicalizing them and also encouraging them to carry out attacks. And the way this is happening is, again, through social media originally. Um, so what we're seeing is Twitter, which is an open platform. Uh, so whatever you say on Twitter, people, everyone can see it. Um, they'll make connections with these kind of guys. And again, I'll, I'll run you through some, some more of this in a second. Um, they'll make connections with these guys on, on Twitter, talk to them. And then at one point, once this virtual entrepreneur, as we call them, who's in Syria, kind of has identified an individual as being uh, potential either to travel to Syria or to carry out an attack in America, uh, they will ask them to move to other social media platforms that are closed. Uh, this is encrypted chats, basically. This is the kind of the latest innovation that essentially most, and it we'll see in, as, as things develop in the tech industry, one of the things now people expect from their messengers, from their, their, you know, their text messaging, uh, et cetera, is that it is encrypted, and like really encrypted, so the FBI can't see it. And then we know the case that maybe uh, between uh, Apple and the FBI, uh, this may have been one of the, this, sort of, this is a sort of seminal case here, where you can, you can see actually the FBI was not able to access this stuff uh, until it actually hired a, a hacker to do it, uh, controversially. But um, the fact is, there are real encrypted apps out there. WhatsApp actually now is one of them too. Another one called Telegram, that where people can have very dis uh, detailed, elaborate conversations about terror planning, and the FBI can't see it, and no one, no one can see it. Um, and there's a, uh, there a number of cases in the U.S. where we've seen uh, plots that have that have uh, emerged 
purely uh, due to this, this use of, of this technology. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset, since our launch, uh, we've tracked 117 criminal court cases involving American IS supporters, reviewed tens of thousands of pages of court documents, uh, interviewed law enforcement officials, reporters, attorneys, connected to the cases, et cetera. In doing so, we identified 19 US-based individuals who were involved with virtual entrepreneurs for the Islamic State. So these are 19 Americans who were in some way or other in contact with this group of guys in Syria who were, who were reaching out to them. Each of those guys circled in red on this graph are what we are calling the virtual entrepreneurs. These are guys who are either in Syria or other jihadist areas who, are, who essentially build up major um, profiles online. They get known, uh, they become pretty much online celebrities among jihadi sympathizers. And they, they, they create these major um, personas and they become magnets for people to go in and, and reach out to. And these guys then sift through everyone who contacts them and tries to figure out who are we going to extend a sort of more of a direct contact with through encryption and encourages them to carry out attacks or to travel. Um, so, 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 through, uh, so the main guys, and actually now most of them are dead, um, Junaid Hussein, uh, the top there uh, with the covered face, British um, hacker from Birmingham, um, who was killed by a U.S. airstrike in uh, 2015, uh, sorry, 2016. Um, he was directly involved, in fact, in, if you, if you know the, the Garland shooting the, 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 in Texas, this was a, a plot by two American Muslims to attack the Draw Muhammad cartoon event in Garland, Texas. They traveled there to, to basically massacre the, um, the attendees. And they were killed on, on the way in by a, a, a local police officer, I think. Um, and what turns out, as we found out and others, um, Alton Simpson, who was one of the shooters, uh, who you can see is connected uh, uh, there on the, to the right, if you can see, to the right of the this green circle. Alton Simpson was in direct contact with Janet Hussein. Um, and Janet Hussein essentially encouraged... Um, and helped Elton Simpson plot this attack. So what you have is, you have zealous young Americans who want to commit an attack, but who don't have any sort of experience into how to do it strategically or tactically. Um, and so you, what you have, what these virtual entrepreneurs are able to do is hone this, this zealotry, and hone this desire, and kind of give them a more of a direct kind of suggestions on how to do the things effectively, and not just you know, lash out and, and don't get anything done. So they, they would give them this very specific ways of, of acting. And actually, with Janet Hussein and Elton Simpson, uh, uh, FBI Director Comey the other, just the other day said that there are 109 messages between Simpson and Hussein that the FBI have no idea what they said. And you can imagine how that can be frustrating to the authorities. But then this also then becomes, this is a major debate between this ongoing tug of war between civil liberties and security. Do we want that to change? We want the government to have more access to encryption. We can talk about that maybe um, in more detail in the discussion time. But this is the, the latest kind of element of this debate is, is, is what is this encryption technology. And this is going gonna, gonna to impact the civil liberties security debate. It's going to be the major uh, uh, headline, I believe, and uh, we believe, of this. Because, as, as we can see here, each of those individuals that are not circled in red are guys who are connected to these virtual entrepreneurs who plotted attacks in the United States. So it's an issue. Um, and one that I, we believe is going gonna, is gonna to form the sort of the future threat. Uh, and in fact, yeah, like I said, these guys were considered to be such threats that they were killed by U.S. airstrikes, uh, drone strikes, most of them. Um, just one more final little story. Um, because guys like this, guys like Janet who's saying, you know, they, they have extra legitimacy because they're not just talking on, inter on the Internet and sitting at home. They're in IS territory. They, they're, talk they're not just talking the talk, but they're walking the walk. You know, they're putting their, their money where their mouth is. And this gives them this extra this extra reason to be listened to by people. He's not just a guy who's a keyboard warrior. And so they are, they become, as I said, these magnets for, for radicalized Westerners to, to approach. Um, and and Junaid Hussein was pretty much the, the, the major figure of that. And, and, you know, when people reached out to him, he was always happy to um, get back to them with uh, any matter from large to small. Uh, in one case, he provided Ohio man, Munir Abdul Qadr, who's, you can see uh, on that graph, um, I'll show you in just a second. Um, with the address of a, so essentially Munir reaches out to Junaid Hussein. He says, you know, I want, I'm, you know, I support IS. I live in America. Like, what can I do? And Junaid Hussein starts giving him specific instructions. 
uh, gives him an address of a U.S. military officer, suggests that, that he goes to this guy's address and beheads him. Um, Abu Qadir also relied on Hussein to provide material details, so things like uh, make sure he was a soldier in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, one text said to, to uh, Munir. Um, Do you know his work schedule? When is he home? Uh, said another text. Um, and then Abdul Qadir would ask him as well, you know, how do you make a Molotov cocktail? Uh, what knife should I use? You know, so from a guy who has no idea what he's doing and how to do it, he's getting specific tradecraft from a real terrorist. He's getting real suggestions to make him more effective, to hone his, his, his zealotry and his desire. He gave Hussein a play-by-play -play of his surveillance of targets, supposed, uh, and also ease of, of purchasing weapons. So at each step, Hussein was there online encouraging uh, Abdul Qadir uh, to carry out this attack. Uh, he was actually arrested. Abdul Qadir was uh, arrested shortly after that, having plotted part of his attack with an accomplice, who it turned out was an FBI informant. Um, so um, I will, yeah, and as I said, th this is what I believe and what we believe to be the kind of the current nature of the IS threat here. And this, this exploitation of um, encryption technology. So and I'll give you just a f uh, final point. Uh, the guy who, who founded Telegram, which is the, pretty much the main platform for IS now online. Telegram is essentially a messaging uh, application where people can, can have discussions, they can, they can provide information, and also offers encrypted uh, chat. The uh, guy, guy who, who set, up, set it up, a guy called Pavel Durov, he set up a group, uh, a company actually in Russia first that did very similar things, and the Russian state essentially took it over. And so he moved to America to set up a similar thing. Uh, and when he asked about, you know, what does he make, what does Telegram make of the fact that, that IS, that, they're, that they're are, they are the main platform for IS activity online, essentially he said, look, this, this is the downside of offering real privacy, that we can't expect only the good guys, you know, to use this. Of course, the bad guys are going to use this. And essentially saying, again, this was his last quote on it, which was a couple of years ago, their position may have changed, but essentially saying that we're, we are willing to absorb this for the, as a price for offering real privacy. And, you know, this is the debate. Um, I'm not offering, you know, immediately my own, you know, criticism of that. I'm just saying this is uh, where it is right now. And we have to, uh, tech companies, governments have to figure out how they're going to uh, move forward on that. And I will leave it at that. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, ISIS has been losing territory. They've been pushed back, and, and they continue to be pushed back. Um, will it get, or do you see it getting to a point where that pushback, as they become smaller and smaller in their, their caliphate uh, territory, diminishes the attraction to that, or do you see it as that they will shift more tactics to try to increase terrorism uh, outside of their territory, or where do you, where do you see that going? Uh, so, one, yeah, so actually that's very related to, to, to what I concluded on, which is, so a lot of these guys who originally contacted these virtual entrepreneurs were contacting them for information on how to travel to Syria. And this was like 2015, 2016. And these guys were saying, you know, actually, there's no point in you coming here. Uh, you, you, we don't know where, where, we could, where you'd be safe. Um, uh, we're losing territory. Actually, you're behind enemy lines already, and this is actually how one of the guys describes that you're behind enemy lines. You're where we want to be. So why would you, don't come over here. So they're basically telling them to shift their attention to actually commit an attack at home. So a lot of these guys didn't originally intend <coughs> to commit domestic attacks, but were shifted towards doing that by IS. So that's one way they have already reacted. Um, having territory <coughs> undoubtedly helped IS to attract people because, you know, this, this idea of the, the, the Islamic State, so the, the IS predecessor, Al-Qaeda, um, kind of, they talked a little bit about setting up an Islamic state, but it was it was presented. Sorry, I'll, I'm just not talking into the thing. It was presented uh, by Al Qaeda, the Islamic state that is was presented by Al Qaeda as something that wasn't on the horizon anytime soon. It was a long, distant pipe dream. So it was harder to get people to buy in because they were thinking, you know, okay, this this sort of this is an abstract thing. You know, I'm not I'm not going to see immediate results. IS kind of have pushed that further by saying, well, it's it's here now. Um, they're, they're, we can't actually succeed through terrorism and through our tactics. The jihadist you know, program can be successful. So that's undoubtedly helped them. Losing territory has meant that the numbers of people traveling from the West there are almost 
have almost stopped completely, and that includes Europe. The Germans recently said they pretty much have no one now traveling there. But what that has meant, as, as I mentioned, as we've seen evidence of, is that they are now being encouraged to do more domestic attacks. So, you know, it's likely that um, we'll see a rise. And actually, we have seen a rise in, in, in domestic plots in the West post-IS struggling in Syria. So the numbers show that that is the case. Let's see how this year goes, I think. You got a question? Is there any, like, light in the story? Like, will technology be able to counteract So yeah, uh, we're, we're not because we're actually we're more of a research center. We're not an activist group. We we more uh, research what what the threat is and sort of offer advice on what to do about it. Um, but yeah, so tech companies are taking direct res more direct responsibility for this these days, um, and they are doing. So I'll give you one example. Um, uh, there's a group called there's a company called Jigsaw. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Jigsaw is part of a another company called Alphabet, which is actually a sister company of Google. It's, it's a Google, basically. Uh, and, but Jigsaw specifically do um, what they're calling counter-messaging online. So essentially trying to offer the alternative to IS, which is a very difficult thing to do because, um, you, know, you know, this sort of idea of counter-messaging, counter-narrative is, is not something, there's no science to it. Uh, but one of the things they're doing, for example, they've, they've developed something called um, the redirect method which essentially um, takes, so if we, we know how online advertising works, right? It, it sees what you're Googling, sees what you're searching, and it starts shooting ads at you related to your interests. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you recently moved your house and you're refurbishing, you know, you're going to get a lot of ads about furniture and, you know, appliances. They, they know really quickly how that, how, what you want. So they're going to, they've taken, they've taken advantage of this by essentially people who are searching extremist stuff um, will get ads sent to them offering alternative, you know, saying, you know, anti-IS messaging, for example. And so, you know, so and I think it's specifically for YouTube. So people who are looking at extremist content on YouTube are, are, off, are given suggestions for alternative um, <coughs> videos. So things like that um, are happening. Um, and like I said, this idea of Facebook, I think, um, are, de are developing or, or looking at this idea of getting the option to show me the, you know, to give me, give me my opposite feed. Uh, and I think there was an article. I think it was in Daily Beast. It was one of the. It was one of these sort of uh, more online platforms where a guy said, you know, I turned my Facebook into an IS account in within within like a week or something. He essentially describes how how long it took him to take his Facebook account and make it one that just showed him IS material. You know, you just like a number of the right things. You read, you know, a number of things. You can very easily, all of a sudden, it becomes you know an IS platform. So that that you know they they are clearly f trying to figure out what they can do to possibly counteract it. But as I said, um, we can probably assume that, the, you know, the net benefit of the internet is, is you know, much higher. Uh, and, and, you know, it's probably doing a lot without, that is not quantifiable to, in terms of preventing people, just in terms of connecting them with, you know, like-minded folks who, you know, share their views about whatever democracy, you know, liberal values or whatever. So, you know, it, it's, it's easy to kind of bash the tech companies and, um, and they certainly have to do more, but, you know, it's also, it's a very difficult world they're living in. And, you know, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg set up Facebook, I doubt he expected to be having these conversations and about fake news and, you know, having to have set up, you know, these guys, they're hiring teams of people to deal with this stuff now. I mean, I, this is not what they thought was going to happen. They didn't realize they were, I don't think that we were going to become this sort of social force. Yeah. Yeah, it was a dating site, I think. Um, yes. No, uh, definitely not. Um, it has to figure out a way to maintain relevance now that it's, it's lost almost you know most of its territory and will likely lose it all. Um, no, no, absolutely not. It will uh, continue to try and set up versions of itself, not just there, but other other parts of the world. Um, it's trying to do that in Somalia, for example, Nigeria, Libya. Um, but the fact was that the, the point was that they set up the Islamic State in the place where it was foreseen in the Islamic text that it would come back. So in, 
you know, uh, Raqqa and, and that part of, of the Middle East is where is where actually, you know, it's, it's meant to come back at, at anyway. So it was th that that location was particularly valuable. Um, but um, no, they, they've not given it up. They had to figure out a way to maintain a relevance and say, you know, OK, uh, it's gone now. But, it, you know, cults, when you have cults that, you know, sort of apocalypse, apocalyptic cults and when they set the date for the apocalypse, it doesn't come. They don't disappear. They figure out ways to survive. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but jihadist groups have shown themselves very capable of uh, reinventing themselves, uh, finding new ways to, 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 to be relevant, uh, finding new ways to attract people. So I wouldn't assume that we're out of the woods. But uh, I mean, IS actually came, if you might remember, just at the time when we thought we were out of the woods. Um, Obama sort of had his mission accomplished moment with this. When uh, Brennan, I think it was, who essentially said Al Qaeda is on the ropes, Al Qaeda is defeated, and it was this, this narrative was out that we, we were out of the woods with, with the jihadist groups. Just when we were saying that, this, this the biggest and most successful jihadist group in history came around. So I, you know, we got to be careful on that. Does yes. Does ISIS have a central authority or headquarters in this country for training logistics and and? territorial decline, if it doesn't, is that more likely to occur? It would be very difficult to do that here. Um, there are parts of the country where we're seeing clusters of people form um, who are going together to Syria or are radicalizing together. There is no official, as far as we know, official IS presence here. It is a virtual one. It's likely that there are, uh, you know, you know, sort of charismatic preacher types here who are encouraging people behind closed doors. But no, th in terms of the actual recruitment activity, it's almost solely virtual. Um, but these connections they can make with, with real world terrorists abroad through these encrypted apps makes it quite easy to feel that they're part of it. Um, I don't think that'll change. I mean, the FBI are pretty on top of it. Uh, I mean, I would be quite surprised if there was any real official IS presence here. I, I, not that I know. Yes, ma'am. So there's no actual relationship between the IS and all the local mosques that we have in our community. N not that I know. I mean, not that I know of. I don't, and I'd be very surprised. It's, this is not generally happening happening in the mosque. It's, this is happening outside on on the internet. You know, the mosque would generally be kicking people like that out, reporting them to the, the authorities. I, I don't. There is not much evidence that that this is happening. Uh, in that way, in a way that it kind of did many, many years ago here and in Europe. In Europe, that's more of an issue because you have you have areas of, of France, for example, Germany that are, you know, largely kind of uncontested by the authorities where people can kind of act a bit more freely. Um, but that's not happening here. No. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would think that one of the tactics of the anti-terrorist groups would be to identify as an interested American. And wouldn't that lead pretty directly to one of these entrepreneurs? Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't quite catch. I would think that the anti terrorists would identify online mm -hmm. as an interested American. Okay, yes, yes, yes. No, that, so there's a lot of that happening. So, so a lot of informant work. Of yes, yes. Uh, well, like I said, most of these guys have been tracked and killed yeah. um, already. Uh, probably because they're so active online, at some point it would be pretty easy to fix their location. Uh, but the FBI do a lot of um, informant and undercover work. So they will, uh, they will find a guy who's online act, acting like this domestically and befriend them and get to know them and start plotting with them. Um, I think we actually have a percentage of how many were done, were arrested like that. Um, 50, so that bottom right one, 58% of the 170 people who've been charged for IS offenses um, arrested in an operation involving an informant and or undercover agent. So they're very active in that space, potentially controversially. I mean, some people are not a big fan of this sort of so-called sting operations. Um, but yeah, that's one of the major ways they're operating. Um, I wonder about the role that the news media plays in amplifying IS terrorist attacks. In this country particularly, there's a great imbalance between right-wing and online terrorist attacks, which quite frankly are far more likely to be shot by a man mm -hmm. with a swastika tattoo than a man um, but that media imbalance, to me, amplifies the effectiveness of IS, and it seems that the media either doesn't realise this or doesn't care.
Yeah. Um, so in the end, the media shows us what it thinks we want to hear or what we're interested in. That's the business they're in. And for one reason or another, the jihadist groups have captured our imagination much more than the far right. Um, it's probably because while the far right is far more active in Europe and in, Amer and in America in terms of its potential, it's not a very coherent movement. So you have anti-federalists, you have neo-Nazis, you have white supremacists, you have you know, um, these guys, sovereign citizens. You have so many different types that it's not a homogenous single movement. It's much harder to pin down people understand it. Um, so I think it, you know, they give the consumer what they think they want. Um, and yeah, absolutely, that is, it amplifies the, the, the view of the threat as well. I mean, I think if you, I think recent polling of Americans shows that, um, you know, I, I think about a year ago, a polling showed that, um, you know, Americans identify IS as pretty much the biggest threat to their, in their lives. Um, and, you know, I think statistically you have more of a chance of whatever, you know, being killed by a four-year-old who found their dad's gun or something. Uh, I think a lot, by a heck of a lot of a percentage. But, um, you know, it's focusing on how much of a direct threat in terms of, like, how many people they kill every year is only one part of understanding terrorism. So, you know, the bigger impact of terrorism, uh, and particularly of the jihadist type, um, is, is not the numbers that it's killing, but it's what it's doing to the society that it's attacking. So terrorism really is about um, much more than that. So it should, we shouldn't just play a numbers game on it. it. It divides societies. It makes people turn perhaps more to illiberal politics. Uh, it turns people against each other. Uh, it creates fear and panic and anxiety. Um, so these are the things that, that when we look at the threat, we have to also to acknowledge. And there's no doubt that the jihadists have been very effective at splitting societies, at turning people against their fellow citizens. Um, but yeah, of course, the media have a responsibility. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm realistic in the sense that they're going to tell us what, what they think we want. In France, after the killing of a Catholic priest by an IS operative um, in uh, Nor Normandy, I think it was, I'm not 100%, um, a couple of major outlets made a decision not to name the attackers. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say I'm not, I'm, I'm split on that. Because in the end, it's the responsibility of the editor, of the press to report the news, not to decide what we should and shouldn't hear. But you can see, you can understand the, the, the thinking behind that. The news, because IS have been extremely effective at manipulating the media for their own propaganda. Absolutely. I mean, the most, the biggest amplifier of its propaganda has been the Western media. And it's doing a big part of its job for it. But that's, then what is the media supposed to do then? It has to change its entire ethical setup. It has, to, it has to decide, you know, either it reports the news or it starts filtering it. Or possibly it, it becomes another tool of counterterrorism in the sense that you report it, but you equally report that a balanced thing. Yeah, I think you can certainly say that. But like I say, it's much harder to report on the far right. I have to say, it is harder because it's just not, it's not as easy to, and they, they haven't, and also they have not had their 9-11, as it were. You know, there's not been, you know, a major... You know, in, in, in Europe, there has been Norway, you know, the biggest terrorist attack in, in, one of, in one of the biggest in Europe's history was committed by Anders Breivik, a far-right extremist. So, um, yeah, Oklahoma, yeah, of course. But, how, you know, that was a generation almost ago, really, wasn't it? It's unfortunately, unfortunately, it's a, it is an issue of, of immediacy and timing. And, but I accept that it's absolutely an issue. Apart from social media, prisons have been the classic locus of radicalization. Yeah. Do you have any sense of that dynamic is active in the United States? Um, so I'm, I couldn't say that I've looked at it in great detail. Um, but absolutely, um, in Europe, for example, it's, it's considered to be a place where people go in as petty criminals and come out as like ideological jihadists. Um, because, you know, in the end, you often go in and you have to join a group of some sort for just protection. And there is the Muslim group, as it were, sometimes. Sometimes if that's being influenced by a radical guy, uh, that can have a very bad effect. Um, I'm pretty sure there are some examples of this in the U.S., but I have to say, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. I, didn't, I wouldn't want to give you the wrong info. But yes, it's absolutely an issue that's very understudied. That's the other reason we don't really know much, because you have to have access to very difficult places to access, supermax prisons. Yeah. Would you say that the FBI and the intelligence uh, Yes, I, 
would say they're doing an excellent job. Um, you know, it's a pretty, like I said, it's a pretty minimal threat here. And that's largely down to the, the, the work of the FBI. Um, and despite the impediments they have, um, yeah, I could, um, I think that, yeah, and uh, if this is in comparison to, example, the challenges they face in Europe, um, if you look, I mean, again, I'm, I'm hesitant, you know, it's, it's always the reaction when there's been a big attack is to kind of, to look at the, the agencies and kind of blame them and say, well, you know, this guy, he was on, you always hear he's on the radar. He was on the radar. You know, every attack, the London attack, oh, you know, he was on, he's always on the radar. And the people use that as a, uh, as a criticism. They say, oh, you know, well, if he was on the radar, how did he, you know, how did, I don't know, but, but realistically, you know, there's only so many, you know, crocodiles around the boat that they can, they can, they can whack, as it were. Um, and, you know, unless you want to have a security agency that is monitoring 3,000 people at all times, then this is an unrealistic thing to request. You see, okay, this guy was a person of interest at one point. We, we gave resources to that. What, are we, what can we, we had to shift the resources somewhere else, unless we wanted to expand massively the surveillance. Um, so, but there are, so having said that, there have been cases recently in Europe that, you, that they have been questionable. The, the, the Brussels bombings, for example, and the Paris attacks were committed by individuals who really shouldn't have been able to, to be there who were pretty much making their intentions known uh, on prop in, through IS propaganda, who were traveling across the borders, back and forth, um, in ways that really shouldn't have been possible. And actually, this has been a big blow to the, the, the idea of the EU free movement of people, um, the Schengen zone, uh, which I think is going to really struggle to survive, uh, especially if there's another attack like this. Because essentially, we saw with the Belgium, the Brussels attacks, that one of the reasons they were able to do this is because they didn't have to show passports when they crossed the borders. No, so it's a big problem um, there. Here, there's not an issue for us. Why do you think they haven't gone for a high profile location in uh, America, like in the Disney World or like the Super Bowl or World Series, something like that? Um, well, I think if we look at like plots that have been foiled, I think there have been ones that at, at major events and, and at major like, monuments. Um, but again, one of the reasons is also because that um, generally like jihadist strategy in the West has changed since definitely since 9/11 to being um, more kind of things that are easier to commit, things that are actually work. You know, something big, it's very likely to get caught, get get foiled. And in order to just maintain some presence here, they're basically telling people, you know, low-level stuff. Like the, like the virtual entrepreneurs I was mentioning, they're telling people, you know, get a knife, go out and just kill like one person if you can. And no, no celebrity or big figure, just someone, just so we can claim something, uh, just to maintain that presence. So they've actually lowered their expectations, they lowered the bar strategic, as a strategic, you know, decision to just at least maintain some presence, not just keep failing in major spectaculars. Of course, they'd love to do it, but they're just being realistic on it. It's a pragmatic thing more than anything else. A lot has been made of the use of the term Islamic extremism or Islamic terrorism. Yeah. It's almost like a litmus test. Uh, does the use of the word or the non-use of the term help or not really make any, make any difference in the long run? So I, this is just my personal view. Um, I think the two administrations, that we, the one we just had and the one we're having now, have both made mistakes on this. Um, I think the previous administration made a mistake in telling people, uh, and basically not mentioning it at all, and saying to people, you know, not allowing people to have any sort of sophisticated discussion about the role of religion in, in, in terrorism, and in this case, the, the role of the Islamic religion. Now, you know, I caveat this obviously by saying the vast majority of Muslims have no interest in violence. Islam can just as much teach you about not killing people as it can about uh, potentially killing certain groups of people. Um, and even that is a you know, debatable statement in terms of the, the violence. Um, so, you know, I think it would be not allowing people to fully understand the topic if you don't let them say, okay, yeah, where, where does religion play a role here? Let's discuss it rather than just stop, you know, not allowing anyone to talk about it. But, you know, in the current administration, we're seeing this sort of an overreaction to that. But I think part of that, the response, the positive response that, that the administration has to some extent gotten with that kind of language, at, at least in the run-up to the election of the, of the president, um, was by people who were fed up of being told, you know, um, of being felt as if they were being told they can't have that discussion at all. So anyone who was saying it, 
they were willing to listen to them. And this is, again, where the mainstream have to understand that if you want to deal with a topic, you need to deal with it yourself. If you don't talk about it, the extremists are going to do it. And if you, you need to own these topics and not pretend they don't exist. The Obama administration, I think, made a big mistake in just ignoring it. When you do that, you let everyone else take over, and you let them become the voice of it. And when that happens, and this has happened in Europe, too, hugely, um, with issues of immigration or, and, and religion, is if, you don't, if the mainstream don't even talk about it out of a fear of, and out of a desire to be politically correct, they just open it up for the wrong people. And that is one of the reasons I think uh, you know, Trump got the reaction he did in the, in the run-up to the election. You know, people were willing to kind of say, okay, at least he's saying it. Maybe in a crude way, in a, in a, in a, but he's, at least he's saying it. And I th uh, so actually, yeah, I would call it, I would say there is, an, there is, of course, an element of religion to, in this. You know, these guys at least think that they are, they are practicing Islam as it should be practiced. There are, you know, religious sheikhs, figures, you know, clerics who are, you know, who are preaching this stuff. There are actually, you know, there are, you know, scholars of Islam who have said that this is, this is, this is okay, a small minority, but there are. If we're going to pretend that it's nothing to do with it, then I think we're just not letting people get a full grasp of it. I get is my convoluted answer. Did Barack Obama think it a misnomer that it's not radical Islamic terrorism, it's radical Islamist terrorism. It comes out of that culture, but not out of that religion. So, yeah, I mean, firstly, yes. So one of the things that, you know, at one point, I believe the administration removed the word Islamist from everything, too. Because, and instead of letting people have a sophisticated, at least some sort of discussion about the difference between Islam and Islamism, right? We can say, you know, Islam is the religion. It's a spirit, you know, largely spiritual, personal journey, etc., like the others. Islamism is a political ideology based around the idea that Islam is, offers you a program for the creation of a society, that the Quran is the constitution, and that, you know, Islam is, should be, is, is actually a revolutionary political system. Um, but that's not to say that, that, that's not removing religion from it, but it's a politicized ideology. The Obama administration, I don't think you can find someone saying Islamism in the whole time that Obama was president. And I find that to be very problematic. And I think the reason was, it was an innocent one. They thought, well, people are going to hear Islamism and they're going to hear Islam, and then we, we're going to be just part of the Islam bashing, etc. I think that was a, a mistake. And I think they should have allowed it to be a more open, sophisticated discussion rather than just closing it down in the way they did. And I believe that part of that, the reaction we've seen is, is, is a result of that mistake. So in terms of Islam, or Islamists, is there any relationship between ISIS and what's left of Al-Qaeda? Yes. Um, well, IS essentially is, is, was an outcrop of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and essentially IS changed its stance in the sense that it said, we want to we, we want to create this state now. Al-Qaeda said it wasn't the right time. And essentially it just became a rivalry issue where IS went to Al-Qaeda and said, look, accept we are the head of this movement now. Um, and if you don't accept that, we'll kill you. And they've ended up a lot of infighting. So a lot of the Americans who went and joined IS ended up spending most of their time fighting fellow jihadists. And they're like, you know, we didn't come here for this, you know. So, um, so there's no, no, I mean, I'll, the current people who still um, identify as Al-Qaeda are in direct um, conflict with IS. So the group is called Jabhat al-Nusra, is the, the Al-Qaeda affiliate in... in, in, in so no, no. But most American, you know, the people who are divorced from that, you know, sort of strive in the Middle East who are out here, who are kind of idealistic jihadists, they're not as concerned with that. So a lot of the guys we find were originally interested in Al-Qaeda, and then just, you know, IS became the, the bigger name, the spearhead of the movement, so they kind of gravitated towards that instead. So that difference does not as important here as it is in the Middle East. Yes. Uh, where does ISIS get, get its money? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it originally was the oil fields that it ran, um, black market economy. Um, when it went into the... Uh, um, into uh, was it Petra in Syria when it destroyed the, you know took the classical uh, artwork sold a lot of that on the um, black market it didn't just you know they destroyed a lot of those statues but they they took a lot of them and sold them so you know sort of just if you look at how international gangs fund themselves um, you know bootlegging cigarettes things like that they're doing the same stuff just the black economy I can yeah I think I'll take one more so. Uh, this president ran on a 
platform say that uh, IS was infiltrating the refugee populations. Your numbers don't seem to bear that out. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, look, um, if, I, if we look at the, the facts that we have in front of us in Europe and in America, the, the threat of jihadist terrorism comes from uh, a domestic population. But having said that, um, and yeah, in the U.S., the vast, as I said, vast majority are not, you know, not refugees. Now, you know, we heard some number recently, 300 investigations ongoing of refugees, uh, but we haven't seen any more details on that. I, I can only see what I've, I can only discuss what I've seen. I haven't seen any evidence that refugees pose any sort of major threat here. I think what, you know, the thinking, I think, behind this is guys like Bannon, um, who were very interested in Europe. They're interested in, in the Islam and Europe question. They've looked at that for a very long time. And they've been talking to guys like Garrett Wilders and Marine Le Pen, and, and so sort of the far-right anti-immigration politicians. Um, and they're thinking, okay, so, you know, in France, there are major populations of, of disenfranchised Muslims who came, who are basically the families of refugees and immigrants, who today pose the terror threat. You know, the children of these immigrants who the state and, and who failed to, you know, get integrated and, and play a role in the society. Um, we don't have that here, firstly. The, America does not have that issue. It doesn't have any disenfranchised Muslim population. Um, but what, yeah, so when Bannon saw that and, 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 and this, these strategists saw, they, they're just, they're thinking, okay, we don't want America to even, we, we're playing a long game. So we want to stop that, what they saw as the root, which is the original flow of, of you know, Muslim migrants and refugees into America. Uh, they, they don't want the next generation of their kids, say, for example, to become, you know, what has happened in Europe. But, you know, it's just not the same story. Um, in fact, Muslims in America are demographically in a very good position. In Europe, they are the bottom of the rung almost across the board. Uh, I can tell you know education, literacy, jobs they're you know struggling massively um, because of largely failed integration and immigration policies um, so this was an attempt to sort of what they saw is prevent what happened in America happen in, ha what ha prevent what happened in Europe in America, but I think misguided um, because I think it's just a t totally different story um, and yeah, the evidence does not show that refugees pose a terrorist threat it just doesn't thank you. Uh, comforted and informed by just by the knowledge that we're getting straightforwardly from you. A very valuable conversation. Yeah. Thank you.